Well, we are in the third session of our review of the Epistle to the Hebrews. And uh, this is really quite a book. We're going to find out two things about Christ in this book, very distinctively in this book. We're going to discover that He reveals God to man. We're going to see an a insight into Christology, as a theologian would call it, that is very distinctive in this book. You are also going to discover that He, even though He is God, represents man before God. And that has some very interesting ramifications. So he is, we're going to see Christ exalted, and we'll see Christ in his humiliation, both uh, pursuing God's will for the creation. The book of Hebrews is sometimes called the riddle of the New Testament. There are more people confused about this epistle. It, is, it contains several passages that are regarded by many as the classical paradoxes, the ones that are, uh, seem to be uh, doomed to confusion. And I'm going to suggest that if we go at this carefully and really pay attention, all the riddles that plague most students of the book will evaporate. That if you do your homework and you follow it through, it's going to be, not only will those riddles be resolved, you'll get a grasp of some breathtaking realities that escape most people. So it's the riddle. The first thing is authorship is considered anonymous. Not only is it anonymous, you'll discover it needs to be because of the circumstances behind it, strangely enough. And so uh, the, the commonly, except in the very earliest ages uh, of the New Testament, it was ascribed to Paul. And we hold the view for lots of reasons that Paul did write it. However, we wouldn't insist upon it, we wouldn't be dogmatic about it, for there's lots of good reasons that it doesn't matter who wrote it. It is skillfully designed to be independent of the author. It basically builds our, its arguments by quoting the Old Testament, drawing upon the very foundation of the readers. So it's really a bridge, and it doesn't matter who built the bridge, is it strong enough, is it real, is the issue. And Paul did not sign it for good reasons, and we talked about that in the early sessions. I won't go through all that again this time. Some people think Apollos wrote it, Barnabas. There's all kinds of conjectures you'll run into if you study the commentaries. These other conjectures suffer from one particular issue. They have no, there's no evidence for any of them. There's a lot of evidence to indicate it was Paul. It doesn't prove it, but we're going to just... You'll often hear me slip, instead of saying the writer of the book, as I try to do most of the time, I'll often say Paul this and Paul that. So just recognize I am not insisting that Paul wrote it. I'm just telling you I candidly believe it for a lot of reasons, most of which we covered in the earlier two sessions. We're in the third session here. So we do know a great deal about the author. He had a vast knowledge of the Old Testament. And he also was a Hellenistic Jew. He also had a great Greek education. But the important thing given those two facts, is he is writing to Jewish believers. These are not people who are unsaved. These are Jewish believers. And they were under much persecution. That's obvious in, from the context of the letter. It's very important that you understand who the readers are, who it was written to. Because if you're confused about that, you'll be confused about some of the solutions. And uh, you, need, you won't understand the solution, the, que the answer, unless you know what the question was, so to speak. So we'll do that. The main issues that you're going to confront here, confront here, there are five warnings in the book. The nature of those warnings is essential to understand. And uh, we'll deal with that very, very carefully as we go. And we'll encounter the first of those five tonight, as you get a feeling for it. But this will all begin to yield its ambiguities if you understand to whom it was written, and you need to understand the dangers that are presented for not persevering. And uh, that's really, the, there's a great deal of revelation in this book. There's an awful lot of things we'll learn. But the main thing you want to carry away from this experience is the five dangers, warnings, that will be covered. And they, ask, they're very def uh, they have some very specific characteristics. We're going to see a composite portrait of Christ that's unique in the New Testament. The coming rule of Christ. Christ is going to rule. 
And you'll be shocked to discover why it is that most churches miss it. But uh, this, this whole book begins and centers on the coming glory of Christ from the Old Testament. I, as we open one of the other sessions, what Bible study is given by seven different people on 12 different occasions in the New Testament and is rarely and always had great fruit and is never given today? And the answer is presenting Jesus Christ entirely from the Old Testament. In the book of Acts, when they had the scriptures, they're basically talking about the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That's what they used. That was their Bible. Presenting Christ entirely from the Old Testament. This book will do that. We'll have seven quotes just in the first chapter, we, uh, uh, so forth. And, uh, the, and it's interesting that these quotations are not from the Hebrew Old Testament, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was done three centuries earlier. But um, most of the, most, not all, but most of the quotes in the New Testament of the Old are quoting from the, Sep the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was the Hebrew tra uh, Old Testament was translated into Greek about three centuries before Christ's ministry. And uh, it's interesting that that became very much the, uh, the Christian's Bible in the early centuries. But it's what most people don't realize. It's amazing how many commentaries they've gone through. They do a great job about many things, but they miss the key point. The kingdom of Christ is the grand central theme of all scripture, and I'll show you that specifically as this evening unfolds. In fact, we'll take a quick snapshot from Matthew's gospel. The last few verses of chapter 23, that's just before the Olivet Discourse, 24 and all of that, Matthew describes the purpose of all history. He describes the tragedy of all history. I should say Jesus does in Matthew. Jesus presents the purpose of all history, the tragedy of all history, and yet, the triumph, the ultimate triumph of all history. In just a few verses. Wow. That's pretty pithy. That's pretty tight. That's very specific. Starting at, it's the last three verses of that chapter. Matthew 23, starting verse 37. Jesus says, as, he, as, he, as he's you know, entering Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often... I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings. That is the purpose, God's purpose, of all history, is to gather his own. That's what it was all set up to do. That's the purpose. The tragedy of all history, and ye would not. The Messiah that was prophesied in great detail through the centuries shows up on schedule. The specific day that he would make his appearance was predicted by Gabriel to Daniel, etc., etc. And in spite of all that, they rejected him. That was the tragedy of all history. That plunge, that nation into blindness, decree, Jesus decrees blindness upon it and so forth. Not forever, but for, for virtually 2,000 years. He says, behold, because of that, you would, you would not be, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That leads to the diaspora, as we call it. But that's not the end of the story. See, the tragedies ye would not. The triumph of all history is the next verse. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till, that's a key word, you always want to watch for these untils in Scripture. That's a milestone. You will not see me henceforth until ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When is Israel going to say that? At the end of the tribulation, it'll take the tribulation to drive him to the wall to wake up. How do I know that? From Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, the last verse of Hosea 5, Jesus says, I will go and return to my place. To return, he must have left it. I return to my place till, there's another one of these untils, they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. Acknowledge their offense, that's singular and specific. And seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That's the purpose of the tribulation, and on it goes. Well, getting back to the book of Hebrews, the kingdom that Jesus is coming to take over is the grand central theme of all Scripture. And I have been pre-millennial all my life, but I never fully appreciated that it is, the millennium is simply the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. We'll talk about that as this whole book unfolds. Now, this, is, this suddenly makes it clear why most church, not all, but most churches don't see this because they have been brought up 
in a denomination that has a tradition of what they call amillennialism. Amillennialism is the denial that the millennium is literal. Well, it only appears in one chapter in the Bible, Revelation 20, and that's just an allegorical thing. He's going to rule in our hearts and so forth. They have a way of, of trying to just treat it as an allegory. The tragedy is it's not just in that one chapter. It is throughout the entire Bible. There's more, there, there is more prophecy about the millennium than any other period in the Bible. Once you realize it's the fulfillment, of, there are four unconditional covenants. The Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the everlasting covenant. The Davidic covenant's an everlasting covenant. And we'll, talk, we'll, we'll be dealing with that as we go through. But that, that puts this whole thing in a totally different complexion. The millennium is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Now what this is going to lead up to, and the reason it's so important for you and me, is our inheritance. You and I, as believers in Christ, have an inheritance, but it's not inevitable. It's one that we can forfeit if we're not faithful. can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your inheritance. That's what we're coming up to. Our inheritance, not our justification, and we'll get into that later this evening. It's our inheritance that's in view. And whether you get the inheritance that's set aside for you depends on your faithfulness and your obedience. And that's big news for many. Now, if you want to stand back from the whole book, the book is, among other things, it's going to attack the major pillars of Judaism. And it, it, towards the end of that, Judaism alone is not the answer. When you get to the end of the Old Testament, you've got unfulfilled prophecies, unappeased longings, and so forth. Without the New Testament, it's incomplete. But with the New Testament, it is not only completed, it's superseded. And that's the point of the right author. And he doesn't, he doesn't make this point from a position of apostolic authority. Quite the contrary, he doesn't, he deliberately, that's why he doesn't sign the letter. He lets the logic stand on its own feet, leaning only on those beliefs that the Jews hold so dear. It goes and he builds the whole case from the Old Testament. He'd learned that whenever he speaks, that he causes riots. He didn't want to prejudice the letter by having it signed. Let it, it's, a, it's a treatise. It stands on its own two feet. Even today, that's true. Many people who are in Messianic fellowships find themselves getting in under the law. and They don't, they don't regard Paul as seriously as most of us do. For this letter, it doesn't matter. Not signed by Paul. It stands or falls on its own foundation, which is, of course, the Old Testament. In it, we're going to discover, it's going to, it's going to attack certain tenets of Judaism. But the real issue isn't that. The real issue are five warnings that we're going to encounter, and we'll get the first of those tonight. And those warnings, the issue that lies under those warnings is our inheritance, not our justification. But uh, watch as we go. The, the book is also distinctive in that it describes the priesthood of Christ. We all know about Christ up through the cro cross. He died for our sins, rose again the third day. What's he doing today? He's got a new job. He's our high priest. What does that mean? It's not a Levitical priesthood. It has some very significantly difference, and there's also a new covenant rather than the old. We're also going to encounter what we call the Hall of Faith, a, a tour de force of the great leaders of the past, and they have lessons for all of us. And the key lessons that will come out of all of this is becoming an overcomer. We'll discover there are all kinds of promises for the overcomer. And uh, even people who fail to become an overcomer are still saved, but they just forfeit their inheritance. That's the end of it. And we'll encounter a term called the metakoi, the partaker, the one that has become an overcomer. Jesus has three offices, and they're summarized in this book. His prophetic office, his kingly office, his priestly, prophet, priest, and king. That's our Lord. All three will take new focus in this epistle. Now, in the first three verses that we took the first night of our session, we see that the Son of God is the final revealer of God. He's the heir of all things. Through the Son, the ages were made, the, 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 the various time domains. 
He's the brightness of God's glory. He's the image of the Father. He upholds all things by his power. He made purification of sin. He sat down on majesty. And this was all laid out, a whole panorama of Christian, in three verses. In just three verses. Wow. He superior to the angels He's in, in several ways. The next 14 verses of chapter 1 we saw last time, he superior to the angels by virtue of the fact that he, of his deity, but he's not finished there. He's also superior to the angels because of his humanity. You've got to be kidding. If God made him lower than the angels, how can he be superior to the angels? Well, we'll see. That sounds contradictory. And also by virtue of the salvation he provided. So that's, that, that's the, the, the first line we had last time. And this time we're going to take the rest of the, these other two. We talked a lot about angels last time. I'm going to review that a little bit because that overlaps in here. We're going to encounter a lot about angels in chapter 2. Let's refresh ourselves. See, the Jews regarded angels as the most exalted of all God's creatures. That was their mindset about angels. They're really up there. Angels are pretty formidable creatures. The law was given to Moses by angels. That surprised me when I first ran into that. Yes, God gave Moses the law, in fact, letter by letter, apparently, but he used angels to do so, and that's both twice in the Old Testament and twice in the New. God came from Sinai with 10,000 holy ones. That term actually, it says saints in your King James, it actually is, uh, it was an Old Testament term for angels. If you were brought up with an Old Testament background, you would walk into this with a very high view of angels. That's important to understand what the writer is getting at as we go forward. They're ministering spirits. They're God's ministers all through Psalms. They also minister to God. They're his, his, they're his agents, if you will, but they're also those that minister to him. They are holy. They surround God's throne. They're seeing do, they often are seen, uh, seen doing battle on our behalf. All through the Old Testament, we see that. An angel stopped the mouths of lions for Daniel. And uh, they sprang people out of prison several times in the book of Acts. They're assigned specifically to care for us, and this care begins at infancy. That's what we call them guardian angels. Guardian. I was surprised to find the guardian angels is a biblical concept, Matthew 18.10. And they also continue throughout our entire lives. Psalm 80, 91 touches on that. The last verse of last time's uh, lesson talks about angels that are sent forth to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit salvation. That's a very key phrase, by the way, that we brought out last time, but let me mention it again. Shall inherit salvation. Apparently, there's an aspect of salvation that's yet future. Not justification, that's past, but there's a part that's future, and we'll explain that as we go further. But it's interesting, one angelic role is to observe us. Do you know they're watching? Girls, they're watching. They're, guys, they're watching what you say. They watch our sufferings. And by the way, girls, they even watch what you wear. Just thought I'd mention that. Now it'll take, take even longer before that mirror, won't you? Yeah, right. <laughs> when a believer dies, his soul is, is escorted to heaven by angels. Luke 16. Now the writer picked seven Old Testament verses to support his proposition that Christ is superior to the angels. To you and I, that might not mean a lot, but to the Jewish mind, that's a high watermark, man. And if Christ is superior to that, whoa, that's, prove it to me. That's tough. He's going to prove it not by his authority or anything else. He's going to show them in their scriptures that's what it says. And we bring, uh, 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 verse 6 of last time's lesson. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten of the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. That's a point. See, the angels will worship Christ. That proves he's superior. It's, it's right there in, in, in the Old Testament. That all the angels worship him. He's quoting from Psalm 97. The point is that the angels are commanded to worship him. Thus Christ is above the angels. In verse 8. He quotes from Psalm 45, Under the, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thy throne. See, the Father saying to the Son, unto thy throne, O God. This is a statement about the Son's deity. The de Angels do not sit on thrones. They don't rule. And how long is Christ's th throne? A thousand years? No, forever and ever. Subtle difference. His reign is eternal. His throne is forever. The promise to Mary 
Gabriel told Mary that her child is going to sit on the throne of David. Angels don't sit on thrones. Okay. And uh, thy kingdom. The, and that this is the kingdom. The thing that, the illuminating thing, just to put in the back of your mind, is the kingdom we're talking about is the Davidic kingdom. It's not a kingdom in heaven. It's a kingdom from heaven. Kingdom of heaven, of and from are identical words in both Hebrew and German. Kingdom from heaven. It has a capital. It's Jerusalem. It has a palace. The floor plan is in Ezekiel. And so on. It's a tangible Kingdom that's coming. It's not some kind of fuzzy, fuzzy thing in the, in the never, never. Davidic covenant. In Acts 15, when they have the big argument, what does a Gentile have to do to become, become a Christian? James, the Lord's brother, chairs that meeting and quotes from Amos 9 that David's tabernacle is going to be rebuilt and that Jesus will take it. Now, Jesus announces a deity. He presents his position, his throne, his kingship. His reference to the scepter. All, this, all these messianic insights are coming out right here in the early chapters of, he, of the Epistle of Hebrews. The excellency or impartiality of his reign. The completion, the, the perfection of his character on earth. The place of his subjection. His reward in terms of being anointed. All these things are already laid out from what we've seen so far. And of course his preeminence in all these things is the point. So I bring us to the next to the last verse last time. We said, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. God never said that to an angel, but that's what he said to Jesus Christ. See, the, the author is pointing out that Christ is above the angels. And he's just getting warmed up, okay? But see, from these arguments, we're not really troubled by that like a Jewish mind might be, but we're learning a lot about what's called Christology, the real nature of Christ. Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemy's footstool. God never said that to the angels. But of course, he did say that in Psalm 110. In fact, Psalm 110 is one of the most oft, often quoted psalms in the New Testament. It's quoted 25 times in the New Testament, 10 times in this epistle. We're going to run into Psalm 110 again and again and again for a number of different reasons. By the way, this is the very verse that Jesus quoted to confuse the lawyers. You may recall that the, the Herodians, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees all tried to trap him and couldn't do so. He says, let me ask you a question. Okay. Christ, whose son is he? He said, the son of David. Then Jesus quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. How can Jesus call him Lord if he's if the son of David? How can he do that? If he's the son of David, how can, how can David call him Lord? And he quotes a psalm that they knew. Gee, they, couldn't, they, didn't, they didn't know how to answer that. And I love the phrase that ends that, that passage in, in, in Matthew 22. They no longer ask him any questions. What most people miss, this is Psalm 110, verse 1 in the English. Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. What makes this a puzzle is that yod vav Adonai, the word Adonai has a Yod at the end of it, which makes it possessive. How can David how, uh, call him Lord, um, Adonai, my Lord? How can you call him my Lord? The my, it's possessive. It's because of a yod. Now when you go to Matthew 5, 17 and 18, remember Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I come not to destroy, uh, the, but to, to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yod or one tittle. Shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. But a yod is the, a little... One of the 22 Hebrew letters that you'd not, you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. But when that finalizes that class of noun, it makes it possessive. Christ's whole argument that confused the lawyers was hung on a yod. Just a yod. And they couldn't deal with it. They gave up. One yod or one tittle. Okay. Let's get back to Hebrews. The last verse of Hebrews, last time we were together. This is all. This has all been sort of review. Are they not all ministering spirits, angels, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of of salvation. Wow. The angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to whom? Them who shall be heirs of salvation. People who are getting something about salvation that's yet future. Okay? Shall be. Okay? You and, uh, say, well, I'm already saved. Indeed. We'll talk about that a little further. A future salvation is in view. Shall be here. 
Justification for regard to, towards that everlasting life is not applicable because that's a past event. When you accepted Jesus Christ, your passport was stamped justified. That gives you entry into heaven. You can't lose that if you tried. There's something else in view here, a future salvation, and we'll try to unravel that here shortly. Those justified already possess everlasting life. It is a gift, not a conditional inheritance. John 3.18, John 5.24, Ephesians 2, 5 and 8. He that hath the Son hath everlasting, not will have, have everlasting life. If you're saved, if you've accepted, if you trusted Christ, you possess eternal life right now. And you can't lose it if you try it. Because it's been committed to the Father to protect. The Son gave it to the Father to, 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 to seal. If you could lose your salvation, God loses something bigger than you. He loses his good word. If you, if you could lose your salvation, you got a new name for God. It's called Butterfingers. Because he's committed. John 10, verses 28 and 9, and other places. You, if you're justified, you're in his hands. You're his responsibility. That doesn't guarantee everything. It guarantees your entrance into heaven. Not bad, but there's more, is the point. Okay? You have a conditional inheritance that's also there. That's what this is really all about. See, those who are about to inherit are Christians. The readers of this epistle are Christians, and yet it's talking to them about that which, for things that shall be heirs of salvation. What on earth is that all about? Well, it's the word salvation, and we're not talking about being saved from drowning. We're not talking about being saved from a burning building. We're talking about what's called soteriological salvation. Soteriology is the study of salvation. It means what you're talking about here is being saved from hell, Okay. The word saved can mean many things in different contexts, but here, of course, we're talking about it soteriologically. So soteriological salvation, justification, or deliverance from hell, is never alluded to in Hebrews. It's taken for granted. And I'll show you that as we go. The writer and the readers are taking that part for granted, for good reason. But there's more to be talked about, and that's what it's dealing with. The salvation that's in view here is eschatological, that is yet future, it's the end times, what's, what's coming for us later? I've got eternal life right now, whether I know it or not, I've got it. Well, wait, there's more coming, and that's what it's going to be dealing with. It's the future aspect of salvation, which is attached to Christ's coming kingdom, and the inheritance afforded to the believer that is in view in this letter. And don't take my word for it, I'm calling your attention to it, you check it as we go. Because unless you understand that, it's, you're going to get really confused. But let's test it as we go. Now, in order to attain the future that he, Hebrews is talking about, faith and works are required. You're not saved by works. But if you, and we'll, we'll, we'll unsort that as we go. Earl Rockemacher, we meet once a year at a, at a study group that we're part of. Earl Rockemacher is a famous, uh, Rockemacher is a fam famous uh, theologian. He loves to come in and say, I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And that's just his way of stirring the pot to point out that salvation has three tenses. And he's the one who points that out. What do I mean by that? The past tense of salvation is justification. That's a gift from God. Gift of everlasting life, and you receive it by faith alone from Christ alone. He did it all. To, add, to try to add to what he did is blasphemy. At the cross, he says, to tell us die. It is finished, paid in full. That is a comp just your justification, paid for by Christ. It's yours for simply the trusting of it. And done. Now, I, I like to make a remark to get people's attention. Most people who get to heaven are going to be disappointed. And the reason they are is because they've been mistaught. Well, if we're in heaven, we're going to rule with Christ. And that's not what it says. It will be, if so be. There's some, there's some footnotes. Getting into heaven? Yes, guaranteed. We'll talk more about that as we go. Sanctification is the present tense. That's not completed yet. That's a work in progress. Every one of us in this room are growing, hopefully. Every one of us in this room, me included, is a work in progress. I'm learning. That's why I enjoy my job so much. I learn something new almost every week. I know a lot more about all of these things than I did six months ago, a year ago, or ten years ago. I've been teaching it for, what, 20 or 30? But I'm learning. And uh, we're, uh, all of us are progressive work that involves faith and effort and works and commitment. That commitment has nothing to do with my justification. Christ did that all. My works 
are just my own growth, and it hopefully will open more of an inheritance to me. That's the present. Now, the, the glorification of the future tense, and that's, that's the result of all the previous. Well, when the sanctification is complete, then we're, 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 it's complete. All believers will be glorified, resurrected, given a body like Christ, but some will have more glory than others. At the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a great diversity from those that just got in by the skin of their teeth to those that have one or several of the five crowns or maybe more to those that are actually going to rule with him. It depends on how faithful they have been. And uh, it's, a, it's a big spectrum. We're talking rewards here. There are rewards and they're diversified. And probably every one of us in this room will have a different kind of reward depending on uh, how we show, what shows up at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. P present tense, separation from the penalty of sin. We call it, the pre the, the, that's the past tense. The present tense is separation from the power of sin. The future tense, separation from the presence of sin. We call the separation from the penalty of sin justification. You're justified. You haven't changed, but the judge has declared you not guilty. So you've gotten that gift because Jesus paid the price for it. That's justification. You're justified by him, him alone. Present tense, separation from the power of sin. If you're a believer, you can call upon the Holy Spirit that will give you what you need to keep sin from reigning in your life. We call that sanctification. The future tense is separation from the very presence of sin. That won't happen until we're glorified. So we have justification, sanctification. We urge our students in the Institute not to use the word salvation because it's ambiguous. It's made up of three aspects, justification, sanctification, glorification. Which one are you talking about? They all can be embraced, any one of them or all of them, by the word salvation. It's ambiguous is the problem. It's too broad a term. This, is, this gives you precision, and that precision is essential if you're going to know what you're talking about. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. He may not have changed at all, but he's declared righteous as far as Christ is concerned. He's mine, he says. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous by calling up with the Holy Spirit to, 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 to govern your walk. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. So they're distinctive. Okay, so last time we, had, we finished chapter 1. The son's position is unique, as we found, as Psalm 2 points out. The son is the head of the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7. The angels worship the son, Psalm 97. These are all the scriptures that were called in view in just the last part of the last chapter. Angels serve the son, according to Psalm 104. The son is going to rule the kingdom in Psalm 45. The son is the creator, Psalm 102. The son is enthroned at the right hand of God, Psalm 110. Here we have seven verses just to get warmed up. This is one, one chapter, right? You get, but you notice the argument does not hang on whether Paul wrote it or whatever. To keep an open mind, it, Paul didn't write it. There it is. It's just a treatise. Does it hold water or not? That depends on your understanding of the Old Testament. If you're a believer and you accept the Old Testament, wow, you've learned a lot about the Son of God. I want you to notice the basis, the authority of the Holy Spirit's Word, not any apostolic authority or authorship. Paul, in this letter, Jesus is called the Apostle to the Jews. So Paul isn't about to intrude on that office. That's why he didn't sign it. And also, it's more effective this way. They, the reader, knew it was from Paul, by the way. We'll find that out before we're through. So Hebrews 1, God has spoken, His revelation is complete and final through the person of His Son, in contrast to the prophets, all these other things. The deity of the Son is emphasized, seven messianic quotations are thrown at you, heirship and inheritance shows up three times in 14 verses, but we'll talk more about it as we go. The Son is heir of all things, He's superior to the angels by means of that inheritance. We're going to talk a lot about inheritance before the, this uh, epistle is over. And Christ's supremacy in the present and eschatological future, He's, a, he's a, a, above all things. So he has more excellent name. He is worshipped by the angels. He made the angels. He's sitting on the throne. He's anointed above them. 
He himself is immutable and eternal creator. These are the main essence of the last 14 verses, uh, the last 11 verses of uh, chapter 1. And he has the highest place of honor. Okay, that, now we're ready to start tonight's lesson. Right? You say, gee, you spent a lot of time reviewing. I think it's important because we have new people joining us, but also it's important to have this fresh in your mind as we go forward here. The Son is superior to the angels by virtue of his deity, then, and by virtue of his humanity, and by virtue of the salvation he provided. The warning number, the first warning will open up chapter 2. He's going to make the case that the Son is superior to the angels, but along the way, he's going to give us five verses, or four verses really, of the first warning. These five warnings are going to be the main pillars for us in this. All five are a unit. They go together and they will complement each other. There's one of these that causes a lot of confusion, but let's keep it in perspective. Each of these five warnings builds upon the other. Each intensifies until the fifth one is a final capstone. The writer relies heavily on Israel's exodus as an example or type of individual Christians. The wilderness wanderings. Paul in his letter to the Romans in chapter 15 verse 4 says, Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learnings that we through the patient and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Everything in the Old Testament is written for us as Christians. That's one of the great tragedies in the common church is that People think, well, the Old Testament is superseded by the New. No, 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 no. It's one book. They're all, they all tie together. The Exodus generation was a redeemed people. They failed to heed God's instruction and was judged for its disobedience. Over a million people were redeemed. Only two inherited. And Moses wasn't one of them. Man, that ought to get our attention. What's going on here? Five warnings. All were written to believers. They do not represent any chance of loss to the past aspect of salvation, which is called justification. That's not under threat. That's a done deal. You need to understand that all the way through. Thus, the, the eternal security of the believer is assured. This is not an issue. That's where people get confused. The warnings admonish believers to press on and obtain all that God has promised to the faithful overcomer. That's what it's all about. The warnings represent the very real possibility of the loss of privileges or rewards that are offered the believer. And this will all be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. We all talk about the rapture, the harpazo is going to take place. Great. What happens next? Well, on the earth, well, we got the great tribulation and all. Wait, wait, wait. Up in heaven, what's going on? The first thing that's going on is the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone before that judgment seat will be saved. But the diversity of rewards could be enormous. And the only tears in heaven, I believe, will be because of lost opportunities. Not for sin or sickness, that's not going to be there. No, no. What would, what, why are there tears in heaven then? Why is God wiping away the tears from their eyes? Because they realize the, oppor what, the opportunities they blew. Oh, if I had just realized. Boy, would I have lived my life differently. Really? Well, let's pay attention. Huh? To whom is this written? The original recipients were Christians. Each warning will substantiate that fact. The correct interpretation of the entire book hinges on the answer to one question. Were the people addressed, believers or unbelievers, saved, unsaved, or half-saved? I'm being facetious. Two dozen times the author includes himself in the warnings and admonitions. We, us, whatever the author. <laughs> Was the author saved? Yes. Were the reader saved? Yes. That's the, the, uh, and later in chapter 10, I can ask you the question, does God urge an unconverted, half-saved professor to hold fast to his false profession? I don't think so. And yet that's what he's a asking them to do, which means they're obviously not unconverted. They are converted. He's, he's telling them to hang in there. So why these warnings? Because God in his love and mercy saw fit to move the author of the Hebrews to warn his readers. This letter God put in your laps to warn you. His love has caused him to put this in your laps. The author who wrote the letter loved his recipients enough to warn them of the impending danger. This is, a la this is a labor of love. Don't let the urgency of it hide the fact that it's motivated by passion on your behalf. God wanted future readers also to understand the grave danger that accompanies apostasy. And it ain't losing your salvation. Why? 
What is at stake? What are these believers going to lose, forfeit, or suffer? Not salvation. John 10 makes that clear, verses 28 and 29. Rewards of the judgment seat of Christ is at issue. We cannot escape this by applying it to other people. The burden of, the, of Hebrews is not the rescuing of sinners from hell. That's not the burden. It's the bringing of sons to glory. Five major warnings were encountered. The danger of drifting, the danger of disobedience, and then there's a group here at Progress to Maturity. And some lists make six, and they make for the chapter five one a, a separate danger of its own. We're going to tie them all together because we think they go together. But on the, the most troublesome passage in the entire book is chapter six, verses four through eight. A lot of people read that out of context and say, oh my goodness, I can lose my salvation. No. There are 16 different views of chapter 6. And we're going to just focus on three of those. And I, I'm going to suggest that if you're paying attention as we go, there won't be any ambiguity in what it means when we get there. Okay, the next one is the danger of willful sin and the warning against indifference in chapter 12. And we're in a 13 chapter book. But today we're going to just focus on the first of these five warnings, which I'm calling here the danger of drifting. So let's now we're, we made it. We're now into chapter two. Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. The word therefore, this means this ties to what was previously said, right? So this points us back to the millennial glory of Christ in chapter one and the believer's inheritance. Because of all that, therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to what? The things we've heard. Lest, why? Lest at any time we should let them slip. The Greek word for slip here is parasiteros, which is used of a boat that has been untied for its moorings and is drifting away. To slip, to glide by, or pass away. Slip away from us. In other words, don't let your inheritance slip away from you. You've got a great inheritance. You're saved. Fantastic. Of course, that's done. But you also have an inheritance. Don't let it slip through your fingers. That's what he's saying. That's the first warning here. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, indeed it was, of course, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, he's going to go on, but whoa, the law was given by the angels. You remember that? This, the if, for if the word spoken, the word if there is what they call a first class condition in the Greek, which in this case, according to the context, means the statement is true. It's if, we would use the word since. If in the, you know, not just if, like maybe, no, since. The word, you follow me? Since would have been, a bit, in my mind, a better trans, but in the, the Greek, they have four conditions for the ifs. But anyway, this is a first class condition. It means that the statement is true. If the law through the angels proved steadfast, and it did prove steadfast, that's the point. You with me? Every transgression of disobedience received what? A just recompense of reward. Reward, okay? Reward is the issue at hand. Now the sentence isn't finished. We're going to continue here. Physical punishment. The two sons of Aaron, remember the Old Testament, Nadab, Nadab and Abihu. They disobeyed the Mosaic law by burning the incense improperly. What happened to them? They were struck dead. That mean they're unsaved? No. Just means they were taken out of the ball game. The rebels, Korah, Dathan, Abiram. You remember Edward G. Art Robinson in the, okay, right? Okay. Led a revolt against the supremacy of Aaron as being the high priest. Remember all that? And God judged them by having the earth open up and swallow them and their families. Woo. Judgment was very, very physical. You read. Achan. And uh, after Jericho, remember, he, 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 he disobeyed the law and he was stoned to death. Joshua 7. Stoned to death. Well, if that happened to the angel, even the angels that sinned, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? See, if that happened to what, for information that came from angels... And we have information that came from even higher levels than that. Ooh, are we more on the hook than ever? Yes, absolutely. That's the point. But there's a lot more to learn here. 
How shall we escape, the writer says, if we neglect? It was confirmed unto us. You see the first person plural there? The writer's putting himself in the same category. Are we together? You see what that means? Okay. By the way, another small point, but it's interesting. That was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. In other words, both the readers and the author were not first person uh, eyewitnesses. It wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Paul would in that category. He's putting himself in that category in any case. The great salvation. What on earth does that refer to? You know, how, if we, how shall we, if we neglect so great a salvation, that refers to its future aspect, not its past aspect. That's pretty obvious, I think. Not past justification, its future aspect. If we neglect, oh, that's a chilling word. Let's take a look at that. The word is amelio, which means to become apathetic, to have an attitude of indifference, to have no care or concern for it. Wasn't that what Esau did to his birthright with Jacob? And what happened? He lost his birthright. And after it was granted, he came back weeping. Can I get another blessing? No, it's done. Done deal, buddy. Sorry. Didn't lose his sonship. He's still a son of Jacob. But, whoops. I mean, son of Isaac, excuse me. But anyway, these, uh, these are people who have salvation. Salvation is in their possession but they are becoming indifferent to it. How do you think God feels about that? He gave His Son to die on the cross. He expects you to regard that, to be excited about that, to be grateful for that, not to say, oh, boy, that's pretty good. That's pretty cool. See, the tragedy is most of us in today's society, well, we've got our get-out-of-hell-free card called justification. So we put our feet on the desk and, boy, I'm, I'm saved. Hope you are, but I'm saved. Hey, I often ask the audience, how many of you are saved? The hands will go up and say, what have you done with it? Why did God save you? Did he accomplish his purpose in saving you? What was his purpose? in You need to find out. Hmm? The law was given by God to Moses through angels, but although it came through angels, anyone who disobeyed it received a just punishment. How much more will this be true if we neglect a salvation mediated through the Son? Oh boy. Oh boy. See, that's what, what, in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord? A great Welsh preacher once challenged. I have a question to ask. I can't answer it. You can't answer it. Even God can't answer it. That's quite a question, isn't it? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That was his text. You can't answer that. I can't answer it. Even God can't. It's a rhetorical question. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. See, God also bearing them witness. So it's really stacking up. Not only from the Son, but God bearing them witness with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. This probably applies to the events at Pentecost. The point of application is that the revelation that comes through the Son carries far more solemn obligations for the recipients than revelation mediated through angels or even men. But it gets authenticated three different ways. First, in the original announcement, it was spoken of by the Lord, okay. It's initially declared by the Son himself, not an angel, but the Son. Second, it had continuous convincing propagation that was authenticated by those who heard him speak the word, meaning the apostles. And the author excludes himself from that group. It was confirmed to us, and that would include the author, by them that heard. See, even Paul met with Peter and so forth and compared notes and what have you. The author, unlike all the other apostles, was not an eyewitness to what Jesus had said, at least in his ministry. He was an eyewitness later, but that's a little different situation. Third, it was further authenticated through the signs, wonders, and powers and gifts. There are four divine authentications. Signs refers to miracles that reveal and have a divine purpose and bear witness of the person's claims. That's one thing. Wonders emphasize the fact that they attract attention and cause amazement. Powers show that these miracles came through a source of divine power. They were supernatural. And gifts are divine enablements. So those are just subtle differences, and I won't bore you with the Greek and all that. We'll just keep moving. A common misconception is that the book of Acts, that all the believers were doing all kinds of miracle signs and wonders. That's commonly believed the only ones who performed miracles were the apostles or apostolic legates, those appointed to do so by the apostles by laying on of hands. 
And this, and this passage indicates that these signs, wonders, and so forth were done by eyewitnesses, not by the next generation of believers. That's the implication of what it's saying here. The spiritual gifts were according to his own will, because God decides who gets which gifts. Right? He gives the gifts severally as he will. That's in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 for those who want to get into that. So what's the, let's summarize warning number one of five. Get with it. Don't be negligent. That seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Paul had an intense sense of urgency. You know, Paul was paranoid. He wrote the book on eternal security. He wrote Romans 8 and so forth. But he had a mentality that he's in a race. And I'll just pick four examples. There are many others. 1 Corinthians 9. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may be obtained. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. He's just getting warmed up. He goes on here. He says, so run that ye may obtain. What is he going? I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Oh boy. Paul is afraid of what? What do you mean, passed away? What was Paul afraid of? Losing his salvation? Absolutely not. You can tell Timothy, I know in whom I believe, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. No, he couldn't lose that if he tried. What's he afraid of losing? His inheritance. His life depended on it. not being cast away. Saved, sure, but boy, did you blow it. Solomon did. King Saul did. Demas did. You can make a list of people who started great, but didn't finish well. Paul wants to finish well. It's not how you start the race, it's how you finish the race that counts. Let's look at his letter to the Philippians. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Reminds me of the Ferrari racer. First thing he did is take the rear view mirror and throw it out the window. What's behind us doesn't matter. That was his attitude. <laughs> I press toward the mark for the prize. Is salvation? No, of course not. Not justification. He's talking about getting as much glory as he can earn. Fair game. Second Timothy, to his protege Timothy, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown. A crown. That's, that's not a gift. That's earned. It's a gift, yes, but he earned it. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. That's one of five crowns specifically specified in the Scriptures. There may be others. In the book of Hebrews, we're going to encounter when we get to chapter 12. The writer will say, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There he goes again. You don't run a race with a, bag, uh, with a, a pack on your back. You want to shed the baggage you don't need to win the race. All of us in here should probably have some baggage we need to shed, don't we? Let's continue with the angels here in Hebrews 2. For unto the angels hath he not put into subjection the world to come whereof we speak. The world to come. We're talking about a world to come. This is not the cosmos, which is often used for this term. Not the eon or the age that's used in Matthew 13, but it's the okonomi, which is the habitable place. It occurs 15 times in the New Testament, 13 times it refers to the earth, the inhabited earth. It's the earth in the millennial kingdom, what we're seeing here. And Matthew 19 makes that clear. See, but the angels, he hath not put the world in, he didn't put the world in subjection to the angels. 
The angels presently minister, there's lots of verses on that, that will be superseded by Christ and his companions, his koinonos, his metakoi. Those deemed worthy at the judgment seat of Christ will reign. Revelation 3 makes that clear. Revelation 21 makes that clear. Those that will rule. There's going to be two kinds of people in the millennium. Sovereigns and subjects. And which one are you going to be? The angels are going to be judged, we know from 1 Corinthians 6. They don't like a rule, they're going to be judged. The, the, in other words, the angels never had authority over the world. One of them stepped out and usurped it, and he got himself in a lot of trouble. That still be all settled. Right? One usurped, but he's being dealt with. His name was Lucifer. The angels ran errands for the Lord. The spirits ministered him, but they never had authority to rule. That's a key point the writer's making here. In Colossians, he wrote, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye shall serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. The reward of the inheritance here we're talking about, not salvation in the, in the sense that, uh, of justification. Judgment begins with the believers. That's mentioned several times in, in 1 Peter 4 and also here. So the Son is superior to the angels in his humanity. Now that's bizarre. Sovereignty over the earth is promised to man, not the angels. When God created the earth in Genesis, man was given dominion, not the angels. God gave man dominion over the earth. Psalm 8 emphasizes that. Man lost it through sin to Satan and his angels. The Messiah regained that dominion for man. And so man will be associated with him in ruling. Now there's some objections that the writer anticipates. Paul now is going to address two objections to the fact that Christ is above the angels. That sounds pretty good, but that raises some problems. First, if Christ is above the angels, yet he became a man, which is lower than the angels, how can he still be higher than the angels while he's in the form of a man? That's a, that's a corker, isn't it? Secondly, Problem number two, Christ died. The angels don't die. So if Christ died, how can that make him better than the angels? Those are the objections. How are they going to deal with? Paul's going to demonstrate that it is his humiliation and suffering which is the cause for his exaltation and his glory. His inheritance came about because of his willingness to lower himself, become a man, and subject himself voluntarily, even unto death on man's behalf. Wow. And that his glory goes beyond all these things, far beyond everything you can imagine. Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or son of man that thou visitest him? That's Psalm 8. Very famous passage. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The puny man. Why, why, you know, why give him all this? And the son of man that thou visitest him. This is not talking about Adam, by the way, because Adam was a son of God, not son of Adam. We're all sons of Adam. Because Adam was a son of God. Paul uses the term the last Adam as a title of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. And now he's still quoting from Psalm 8, verse 5. Made us a little, this is widely misunderstood, brachus means short, small, or little, but it can mean it in one of two ways. It can be little of place, like a short distance, a little distance. Or it can be of time, a short time, for a little while. And that's the way it's being used here. Made him for a little while lower than the angels. Okay? Make more sense? It's quoted in Philippians too. That's why it causes number of people confusion. It's the, it's the, it's the short, it's the time shortness that it's in view here in the Greek. Puny man. See, in the middle of the metacosm, every, the whole cosmos, there is a macrocosm, how big it is, the physical universe, and there is the microcosm, how small can it get. Man is in the middle, right in the middle of this. Both are finite, by the way. That is the incredible dis discovery of 20th century science. Put man, as far as he can reach, in the middle. And let's make size horizontal. Small to the left, big to the right. You get bigger and bigger and bigger, largeness, you're dealing with astronomy and astrophysics, but you discover 
The great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is not infinite, it's finite. It is finite. That's what gives rise to the Big Bang and all those things. Okay, go, let's go the small way. You would think it could get small, infinitely small. It turns out you can't. There's a point at which it can't get any smaller. That's, it, it, there's a, everything is made up of an indivisible unit. That's why they call it quanta. They're called quanta, quantum physics, subatomic particles. Smallness has a limit. That is staggering its implications. That's why some of the early physicists discovered that committed suicide. They, they, they understood it well enough to realize they couldn't handle it. The entire universe is made up of units that cannot be divided. It's digital. Now, take the atom for an example. We always say in school we have a nucleus of, say, a, a proton, and around it goes an electron. Okay, this is not the scale, obviously. Yeah, right. The nucleus is 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, approximately, in diameter. The orbit of the electron is about 10 to the minus 8, which is a lot, you know, it's five, 10 to the fifth bigger, right? Okay, so the ratio of those two are 100,000 to 1. If you make a nucleus 1 inch, you've got to put the electron 100,000 inches away. Follow me? Okay, so now if you, that's linearly. Volumetrically, it's 100,000 times 100,000 times 100, three dimensions, right? So it's 100, 10 to the 5th raised to the 3rd power, that's 10 to the 15th. Now, if I, if I, if I told you that there, this podium here is solid, and Mary comes up and says, no, there's nothing here, she's more right than I am by 10 to the 15th to 1. Or put another way, the same ratio as 1 second to 30 million years. Okay, I'm saying it's equivalent to one second. She's yes, but you're talking about 30 million year span. It's it's more empty. It's more empty than solid by a rather disturbing ratio. Let's go on. Okay, so is it solid? No. Is it empty space? No. Because it's more it's more empty than it is solid by that ratio. If I take a line and cut it in half. I can take what I've got left and cut it in half, right? Take what's left and cut it in half, right? And you would think I could do that forever. Whatever I've got left, I could cut in half. You'd think I could at least conceptually do that forever. It turns out I can't. It turns out when I get 10 to the minus 3, 33 centimeters, that's very, very small, but if I get that small, I can't cut it in half. If I cut it in half or try, it is suddenly everywhere in the universe at the same instant. It loses a property called locality. You've got to be kidding. They lose, at, at the limits, they lose locality. The, there's a, a Planck length of length, time, energy, mass, all have a unit below which it does not exist. It's digital. What's the implication of that? Well, on the macrocosm, in largeness, it's finite. In the microcosm, it's limited. So the total thing is limited. We are, you and I, live in a digital simulation. It's finite, has finite limits. It's made of indivisible units. Scientific American, in June of 2004, had an article about uh, physics constants. Their conclusion is that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. No kidding. That's what the Bible has said all along. That the Hebrews 11, and we're going to get into that in Hebrews 11, 1 Corinthians 15, and elsewhere. Let's move on now. Well, one other thing. This is kind of fun. In Ephesians chapter 3, we have an interesting verse. Paul writes that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is that breadth and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Did you catch that? Breadth, length, depth, height, how many dimensions? Four. And we know today we have, live in four dimensions, three spatial dimensions and one sign. One of those is the Greek word for measuring the length of time. Four dimensions, very contemporary physics. How did Paul know that? Four dimensions. Kind of fun. Anyway, we'll move on. One last observation. I love this because we know we're all looking forward to being resurrected, right? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. We're not going to see a representation of Him. We're going to see Him as He is, meaning we'll enjoy the same dimensionality He does. And His dimensionality is pretty interesting. But that's a case for another day. For thou madest him for a little while, 
lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Adam, through sin, forfeited his dominion. Did he ever have dominion over the angels? No. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. The last Adam, however, gained dominion over everything. And if we don't forfeit our inheritance, we'll join him as a joint heir in that dominion. Wow. Over the angels? Thou hast put all, subjection, all, in subje all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all, subjection, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That means Christ is not finished yet. Your justification is completed at the cross. It is finished. Is Christ finished? No. He has a task still ahead that's going to take him a thousand years to complete. To put all things under the Father. Not, we see not yet. These things are yet future. The kingdom that's coming, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, is breathtaking in its scope and its commitments. This continues, Psalm 8. We're all quoting this from Psalm 8. Unfinished business remains for Christ to do. And we may, if we don't blow it, be joint heirs with him. The Romans 20, uh, Revelation 21, 7 and Romans 8, 17 touch on those things. In 1 Corinthians 15, we have the purpose of the whole program. Ready for this? But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That is until the end of the millennium, gang. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. It's going to take him a thousand years to have it prepared to do that. And it continues, for he that had put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. That, why? That God may be all in all. That's the goal. That's the final big fantastic goal. A thousand years away, the millennium. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Whoops! Taste death for every man. That would seem to deny one of the five basic tenets of Calvinism, limited atonement. The, Calvinist, the, the pure Calvinist would say that Christ only died for those that are saved. Well, that sounds pretty good, except that's contrary to the Scripture. That he tasted death for every man, and it's available to every man that will accept it. Death was anticipated all through the Scriptures. He told them again and again and again. The only one that got it were the girls. They heard and understood. They were there at the tomb. But, uh, and of course, the glory is also spelled out in John 17, Colossians. Continuing verse 10, for it, became, for it became him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect or complete, if you will, through sufferings. The word perfect there, etelio, which means to carry, to consummate or complete. A completion beyond mere justification. That's justification puts you on first base. Finishing well is the issue. In contrast to Saul, King Saul, remember he started off great, blew it. How about Solomon? Started off great, wrote several books in the Bible. Blew it before the end. And Demas. Start off okay, but Paul had a lot to say about Demas. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is sanctification. John 17 deals with it. And by the way, it doesn't mean purification. It's not a condition, but it's a position you have in Christ. You've been set aside. It's a process, but you've been set aside in it that you have in Christ. And he's therefore not ashamed to call them brethren. That's a key word when you start studying the sheep and goat judgment in, um, uh, that occurs 
one of the first things when the kingdom is set up on the earth, you have this very strange, the more you study it, the more questions it raises about the sheep and the goat. There's three groups, the sheep, the goat, and the brethren. You need to understand what that's all about. Mortal people being judged in and out of hell, whichever way, on the basis of, totally a basis of works, by the way. Really? Yeah, check it out. Anyway, verse 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of which, uh, of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. This is a quote from the Old Testament, believe it or not. From Psalm 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. There's the term, same word, in fact, Ecclesia. Will I praise thee? It's incredible. Psalm 22, the first 21 verses describes Christ's humiliation as if it was dictated first person singular hanging on the cross. It includes his seven last words in that, first and last especially. Anyway, go, continuing, and again I will put my trust in him, and again behold I and the children which God hath given me. I will put my trust in him. Jesus trusted the Father. The walk of faith is what this is all about. Every day God has a, finds a different way to ask you the question, ask you the question, do you trust me? Paul points out this is why the Son had to become a man, to, dem to, to walk our path for, on our behalf, to become our kinsman and walk the walk that we needed but to but couldn't. He walked in our, in, our, in our, the walk of faith. How? In the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Romans 6 is all about, that sin need not reign any longer. A hermeneutical insight, by the way. This is quoted from Isaiah 8. And if you were reading Isaiah 8, it would certainly seem like the writer's talking about the sons of Isaiah. And indeed he is, and yet here in this verse, the Holy Spirit of God interprets the reference in Isaiah in a way that refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very profound insight. The volume of the book is written of me. Anyone today who attempts to eliminate the Lord Jesus Christ from the prophets is contradicting the interpretation that the Holy Spirit has given in the New Testament right here. So I'll let you run with that one on your own. But I want you to notice all through this thing, the basis is the authority of God's Word, not any apostolic authority or authorship. Verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. To destroy him that had the power of death, who could that be? Satan. He didn't come the way they had expected. Although they should have known by the prophets, but they didn't. He came as flesh and blood to take our place. Christ came as flesh and blood. There's many that tried to argue that. No, he did. The word destroy here, by the way, means to nullify or put to naught, to equalize, render ineffective. To deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death. The law of God demands death for sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wage of sin is death. It's all through the scripture. Satan was the cause of man's sin in the first place. And even though he's a serper, he can claim that the sinner must die. He had the power, the authority, to demand that every sinner should pay sin's penalty. Now, on account of this, all men, because all are sinners, were fearful of death and subject to bondage because of sin, to serve it, and thus serve Satan. Verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus didn't become an angel. He became a seed of Abraham, took upon him the seed of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then Judah, David. The throne, not the bloodline, but the throne, came through Solomon. The, but the blood curse in Jeconiah, let the throne continue, but the bloodline didn't. The line went through the second, not the first surviving son of Bathsheba, namely Solomon, the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan. Jude brings that out. That comes down through Mary. So. The legal line through Joseph, the bloodline through Mary. Flesh and blood. Jesus came as flesh and blood. And that's detailed all through the Old Testament. His genealogy is encrypted in the Torah in Genesis 38. Uh, Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Yishai, David, five people, 49 letter intervals, their part in chronological order, encrypted in a genealogy in the Torah, books of Moses, long before Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, etc. Ruth 4, it's listed. And of course, there's all the Messianic prophecies you're familiar with. The Messiah became a man so that the sanctifier and the sanctified could be united and then he could call them brethren. That's what Psalm 22 and Isaiah 8 is all about. 
By means of death, he rendered Satan's power inoperative as far as believers are concerned. If you're a believer, Satan has no control because Christ paid, paid for your entry ticket. By means of death, he rendered Satan's power inoperative. The fear of death enslaves and the believer, for, for the believer, death is no longer a punishment but a means to enter heaven. Going to kill me? Bring it on. I'm ready. The sphere of the Messiah's work was man, not angels. The sphere of the Messiah's work was man, not angels. Verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Ho, ho, we're going to have a handful of chapters, five through nine really, all about his high priesthood. If you want to find out about his high priesthood, this is the book that will lay it all out. This is the Leviticus of the New Testament in a sense. And things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And this is a major topic that will be expanded in later chapters. Re reconciliation really should be propitiation to be more accurate, but we don't have to split those hairs here. We'll get into that later. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He is able to succor. The word succor means, by the way, to come to the aid, to help, assist. Originally meant to run and help, but it's, it means just to help and so forth. Because he suffered being tested, he is able to help those who are tested. Could Christ have sinned in the temptation of, of, of Satan? The answer is absolutely not. If he had failed, it just proved that he wasn't the Son of God. It wasn't Jesus. Well, he wasn't the Messiah. The Messiah could not sin. It's not possible. He was just proving he was the Messiah, but not sinning. Do you see the difference? It's an important difference. As we get further along in Hebrews, we'll be studying the priesthood of God. We'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ is able to help those who are tested. Why? Because he was there first. He, he can say, been there, done that. Jesus could not have succumbed to temptation. He could not have fallen. The answer, of course, is no. When we speak of being tempted to do something wrong, we actually mean is that we have the opportunity to do wrong. And we want to do it. That's what makes it sin. Now, the opportunity was that testing, but the desire to do wrong was sin. And a sinful desire is in itself sin, if you nurse it. The Lord Jesus never had that sinful desire. So his superiority, we've just gone through, uh, just to summarize, his superiority of the angels is salvation, to manifest divine grace, to overcome the prince of death, to free the believer from the fear of death, and to help man. Those are the, the gist of verses 10 to 18. Epistle of the Hebrews. Jesus, the new and better believer. We, we, we had that in the, uh, the first seven verses. We'll deal with that. In the next uh, verses, eight and nine, will be a new and better covenant. Better promises, better sanctuary, and all. We'll go through the tabernacle, temple, all that, and a better sacrifice and better results. Well, we have just been through the God-man, better angels. Now, next time we take chapter three, the apostles, we've had all this, the last few chapters, better than the angels. Now we're going to shift to the next major pillar of Judaism. After angels, got Moses. Well, you're not going to attack Moses, are you? No. We're going to show that Christ was a superior to Moses. And he will do that. So next time, I want you to read chapter 3. And we go on to the second pillar, if you will, of Judaism, Moses. And I have a question for you. To, and you can check out Numbers 12, where Moses' authority is challenged rather dramatically and reinforced. What lessons from Israel's failure in the wilderness are there for us? We have this, you know, these 38 years in the wilderness wandering around from one, event, one adventure to another. What are the lessons there for us? Paul tells us in the New Testament, those lessons are for us. What are they? What, do we, what, what, what does that all mean for us? And can our inheritance be forfeited? That's really the lurking problem. We'll discover that inheritance can be lost in the Old Testament and can also be lost in the New. We'll give you examples. And then when we get to the, uh, in, chapter, from chapter, in chapter 3, we'll encounter the second of the five warnings in the book of, uh, of uh, uh, Hebrews. It'll overflow a little bit in the chapter 4. Let's bow our hearts.